think of last week next, we're looking at our good dead friend John Locke, who was talking about the his theory of simple ideas. And the basic idea is that, according to Locke, we're born with a blank um, mind, the tabula rasa, the blank slate. And this is the result of Newton's influence on Locke. Just like you know, Newton saw space as being like an empty thing in which objects existed that are composed of, of particles, Locke takes the view of the mind as an empty place, and then the particles out in the physical world interact with the senses, giving rise to ideas in the empty mind. And so whatever is in the mind has to come from the outside. Well, it doesn't really get in there, but it results in something on the outside. And we saw that he had this notion of simple ideas. And simple ideas are, he think it was like mental atoms. They're like the smallest bit of idea that you can't you know, slice anymore. And I use the analogy of, of like pixels in a in an image where you have the tiniest bit of color that you can have in a program. Now, one type of simple idea is, are the ideas of sensation. They're the ones that originate outside. You know, when we see you know, an object, it wouldn't be like the idea of a table or a chair because it's complex things, but it'd be going with pixel analogy. It'd be like that tiniest bit of color or the most, you know, the, the simplest part. I guess you use points, you know, make up everything else. So a good analogy it would be just little pixels of color that you can combine into more complicated things. Kind of the paint, you know, bitmap view of the mind. The second type of simple ideas are what he calls ideas of reflection. Because he believe the mind, believes that the mind, you know, does stuff. It thinks, it feels, it reflects, it has emotions. And we can observe somehow the operations of the mind itself. You know, so we have what's coming from the outside, our experiences there, and then we have observing the mind's eye, what's going on there, like feeling hungry or, or hangry, I guess that's a, a thing, or feeling sadness or happiness, etc. So we get these ideas of how the mind works. So basically, from the senses, from reflection, and he claims that those are the only two two options, that either external objects we have through our senses or reflecting on what's going on in there. Again, to use an analogy, it's kind of like being in a you know, control center that you can never leave, unfortunately, and you have stuff coming in over the monitors, so you get ideas from that, and you also can look around the command center, and as you're doing stuff, you get ideas of what's going on in there, where the command center is analogous to your mind, and you are analogous to, well, you, <laughs> in that analogy. And so he thinks that if you trace back any idea, then it has to go back to either a sensation or a reflection. Now he claims that this can be shown in a pretty straightforward way. For example, can we know the taste of something before we ever taste it? No, so he says, you know, if ideas got in there some other way, we have ideas that know how something tastes, for example, without tasting it. And so he thinks that this is a pretty you know, conclusive scenario. And another example is the idea of a color. That we cannot have an idea of a color until we, we've seen it. And this does, um, you know, ties into actual science of perception. Could, you know, if someone's, and we'll see this in, in a minute, if someone is born blind, what kind of ideas of color can they can they have? Now, of course, they, they can get you know, descriptions of color. So if someone you know, can't see, someone could say uh, red is like you know, pain or like heat, or that blue is, is like coolness, you know, things they understand. And, and we get well, one sort of interesting example of this is there's a person who um, <laughs> has a camera that like bolts on the back of his head and he goes around to the front, and he's colorblind, so he can't, he can't tell like, which, which color is which. And what it does is it, it plays a note when he focuses the camera on something to tell him which color it is. So if he sees like a, you know, because he can't stop lights, he can't, he can't do stop lights. And so he kind of points it at you know, a particular note based on whether it's green, red, or, or um, yellow. And so he kind of has like a, a musical idea of the, the color. 
And so, yeah, the question would be is, you know, what, what is actually is that idea does it correspond to the, the actual color? And Locke's view is that, well, no, I mean, let's, you could have, I have descriptions of color, you know, red is like, you know, heat or anger, but you wouldn't have the idea of color without experiencing the color. You wouldn't know what it is until you saw it. So those are the simple ideas. And again, the analogy is like a little bit of a pixel, like kind of like on this, this is little pixel things. And also the idea is a reflection would be, I guess, whatever the simplest bit of emotion is, like a little point of anger or something, or a little sad point, a little tear of sadness. Now, we just don't have ideas that are simple, of course. We have complex ideas. And these would be things of, well, backpacks, tables, chairs, bottles, hats, etc. And so the question would be is, where do those come from? Well, he accepts, like Descartes did, the principle of no ex nihilo creation. You can't get something from nothing. So whatever's in there had to have come from something else. So what the mind can do is take simple ideas and combine them. And we could go with the analogy again back to the pixels. You could take a, like a, a paint program and you know, create something by doing a whole bunch of pixels. Or we could use a Lego analogy. You could have Lego bricks, with the bricks being symbols, and you can assemble them into more complicated things. And we can, of course, treat a complex thing with a single name. For example, it could be something abstract like beauty or gratitude. It could be like an army, which could be, I mean, it's, it's a complex of things. But we treat it as a single, single entity. Now, being a philosopher, he's rather obsessed about the classifications of things. So what type of co complex ideas does he have? Well, in the fourth edition of his essay, he ends up having three. I always think of the count, you know, three of these ideas. Now, one type is compounded. In a way, he's essentially anticipating uh, copy paste in you know, Photoshop, because what it involves is taking multiple ideas of the same type and then combining them to create a complex entity. For example, one option is, you know, we get Photoshop copy paste. You could take um, the idea of, say, one human and then multiply it to get a crowd or organize them to have, like, a team or an army. And again, the Photoshop in a way is kind of a good analogy because you could, you could take, you know, people do, like when they're doing, when they're on a budget for movies, you need a crowd. Can't afford to hire a crowd? Well, Photoshop. If you look at some crowd scenes, like, ah, it's the same, like, three people over and over and over again. That's kind of creepy. <laughs> now, the second way to compound is instead of combining ideas that are you know, the same, just like the same sort of picture, like person versus person, is you can take the components of, of something and combine them into a whole. It gives the example of apple. You take like red, round, you know, the ideas of the flavor, and it's, all, it's like ingredients, you know, baking. You combine like flour, yeast, and milk, and salt, and so forth, and heat, and get bread. And that does seem pretty reasonable. You take you know, ideas and multiply them out, getting more complicated ideas, or you take, you know, bits of things, combine them together, you know, kind of like Lego, so sell them into something, a greater thing. Now, he does think, of course, that you can't get anything, any new simple ideas, but you could have, you could get new complex ideas. You could put things together, because one thing that people bring up is, well, people come up with new ideas, so Locke is wrong. Well, his claim is there's no new simple ideas, but there can be new complex ideas. Well, in the sense that you can't just make them out of nothing. You can have a new complex idea in the sense you can take stuff that's in there and combine it in a way that's never been combined before. Or as far as you know, before. So, come on. Now, we can also do this, the, the compounding, we can use that to make bigger things. For example, um, space. We take like small space 
and multiply it out to think of a big space. And a lot of things, and this is where we get our notion of infinity. We could take, you know, the idea of like this space and then keep multiplying it and think of, well, that would be like the, you know, infinite space. Now, probably his most controversial idea is the idea of abstract ideas. And when you look at our good, good friend, um, Barclay, Barclay thinks that you know, abstract ideas are basically the starter drug, the gateway drug of all kinds of bad stuff. So he thinks once you start with abstract ideas, they get you to materialism, materialism gets you to atheism, and that gets you to hell. So abstract ideas are the path to hell. I have to include that one, so just say no to abstract ideas. So what is an abstract idea? Well, one type, oh, a non-abstract idea is, is, second type is the idea of relation. And these are ideas created by comparing one thing to another. So if we say, for example, that you know, the table is smaller than the room, or that bill is taller than 10, and those would be relational ideas. So we've got two types of compounding, relational, and now the pure abstract. Abstract ideas are created by abstracting, which of course is a nice circular definition. It's like saying that you know, goodness is being good, which is true, but not super useful. So what is abstracting in a non-circular sense? Well, it involves generalizing. To give a, a better example, something like this. One problem that philosophers have dealt with for a long time is the problem of universals. In virtue of what is a individual, a token, a member of a type. So in virtue of what is Garfield a cat or Trump a person. And how is it that we classify stuff? Now, so one thing we're able to do, we're pretty good at recognizing, like, if you have a person, a whole bunch of photographs, we're, we're pretty good at sorting out, like, what's, cat, what's a cat and what's not a cat. We're good at that. And then the question is, how do we do that? Because, you know, the cats are all different sizes and colors and poses. So what is it that we're somehow spotting? Plato famously said, we'd be looking at catness. Not catness from the Hunger Games, but we'd be looking at the quality of, of cat or dogness or horseness. And of course, one of his, his critics, Simon Dalek, said, Plato, I see the horse, but I don't see the horseness. So some philosophers accept universals, that somehow there is a catness. We're somehow able to you know, see the, the catness. Now, Locke's view is this. He doesn't accept you know, Plato's universals in this context, so there isn't like Catness. What he thinks that we do is we're able to take all the cats, or in Spanish, the gatos, and somehow generalize or abstract their common qualities and ignore the distinctions. In other words, we're able to somehow find what it is that all cats have in common, the general cat, and ignore or exclude all the things that are not part of that cat is. So on Locke's view, there is something about if we laid out all the pictures of cats, we could find something that ties them all together. And things like the particular shape or color or size wouldn't be part of that. It would be an abstraction or generalization, essentially, what do all cats have in common that's not specific to any cat. And for him, that's the abstractive. Now, the challenge is, of course, you know, both theoretical, like what is that, you know, what is the foundation of that, but also practical. What is it that we that we use to recognize you know, the cat as opposed to the dog? And of course, this is very important practical technical implications as well. For example, usually when you do a search looking for like an image, say looking for like a picture of you know Trump or a cat or something or a Trump cat. Or a cat trunk. 
used to the way the search in, you know, has worked in the past is when you type in like um, a particular thing, like cat, what it actually searches for is not cat pictures, it searches for the word cat proximal to a picture. Which is why if you ever done a Google search, you know, on something looking for images, sometimes it makes sense and sometimes you're like, why is, why is that there? Like it'll have like a picture, you know, like a um, acorn, and you're looking for like cat. And then you'll see like somewhere in the text, and someone like saying, my cat likes acorns. So that's why it's, it's there. So when doing like searches, ideally what you'd want if you typed in like cat, there would be a algorithm of cat. And so it would know, it would search through everything, find all the cat pictures and all the non-cat pictures. And the question is, you know, how do we do that? And is it something we could duplicate into an algorithm? Now Google, of course, is working on that now. They're working on actual image search. That instead of looking just for the word, it actually has like a definition of, of cat or whatever you're, you're looking for. Facial recognition software, a good example of that. Trying to find, you know, faces. Now, matching individuals is a bit easier because you're looking for not what is it to be, you know, human. You're just looking for that that particular you know, person. That's why Facebook, you know, when you put up a picture, it, it often often knows. But even then, it involves some abstraction because you have to have the idea of what it looks like in different angles and different conditions. Catfish. Yeah. Ah, catfish. <laughs> so those are the four types. Compounding, you know, basically photoshopping things together or assembling them like a key of furniture. And then relational ideas, which we build by, you know, get an idea of you know, one thing being, say, larger than another or next to it. And the abstraction. And, you know, this one is the one that creates the most trouble because the good question is, how do we do that? What is it that, that we pull away from, extract from the images of, say, cats that combine, you know, makes them all cats. What is that, that feature we're looking for? That's common to all of us, specific to none. So that's, that's like the quality of the human brain, or? Yeah, and maybe we have, um, <coughs> you know, cat template in there, or we build like a cat template. And, yeah, kind of the question is like, what do we have in there that allows us to, to do that? Uh, Thomas Aquinas or Tommy A, as no one called him. He uh, had the view, interesting view that God had a concept of cat, or, or whatever we're talking about, and he used that kind of blueprint to, make, you know, to create cats. No, psh, grab a cat, it's come to pass. And then what happens is when we look at all the cats, we kind of reverse engineer them. We, we, you know, we see all the different cats and we, we, we build together in our mind kind of a reconstruction of God's blueprint. It's kind of like with, um, well, it's like the Russians and Chinese, you know, well, the Chinese do like the iPhone. You know, what they do is they, they try to reverse, you know, make something like it um, based on, you know, they don't have access to Apple's, you know, schematics and plans and all their technical stuff. So they take the actual iPhone and try to figure out, like, how does all that, that work? And so we do a similar thing. We encounter all the cats and try to figure out what is it that, what was God's plan? And we have in court of quantities, we have in our mind a gradual reconstruction of the cat schematic, and that's what we, we use. For a lot though, we're somehow abstracting away from cats or whatever, the catness, and leaving out all the particular things. Yeah, there's a good question of, you know, someone like, who believes in the ideas, they say it's built in. We have built in, you know, templates for things. And Locke, of course, would say, well, it's all blank. We, we sort of build our, our templates through experience. Now Locke also accepts the primary and secondary distinction that was pretty much a hallmark of this, this time. And he does accept you know, kind of the, the standard approach. So it's not nothing really like unusual here. Now he does run into, of course, the problem of how do we know like that what's in here matches what's out there. Unlike Descartes, though, well, Locke doesn't start off being a skeptic. He doesn't say, you know, I need certainty. He actually never seems to doubt the existence of a natural world. He just says, well, you know, it's out there. But he does accept the problem of how do we know that what we've got going on here accurately matches up what goes on out there. Mainly, he doesn't say 
maybe there's nothing out there, but a good question is, how does what's in here correspond to what's out there? And you may have no doubts about an external world, but still wonder, you know, what is out there? Is color out there? Is, is flavor out there? Now, like the other thinkers, he breaks them into qualities into two categories. He does throw in a third one, but people usually kind of ignore that. That one. These are the primary, the secondary, and powers. The primary ones are qualities that are really in the object for real. These are what we consider the physical qualities. Things like solidity, shape, extension, motion, rest, and today we include things like you know, chemical composition, etc. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, pixel dust again, 8 bit pixels. <coughs> now, the ideas we have of these are correspond to the external world. So, a mock's view, our ideas of primary qualities match up to what's out there. So, our idea of density, mass, and volume corresponds to what's really out there. These are the qualities that could be you know, quantified. You know, something has a density of you know, a particular, you know, particular number. Something has a certain mass, a certain volume. The secondary qualities, though, for him are these. These are the powers of the primary qualities to produce effects in us. And so the secondary qualities are out there. They're experienced by us based on the primary qualities. They don't actually, they're subjective because our experience of the primary of the secondary qualities can vary from person to person, circumstance to circumstance. They're not quantitative, they're qualitative. And they are, well, we'll give some examples. It'd be things like color for him, secondary quality, warmth or cold, uh, taste, the sounds. So, and to show how they relate, we can take a good example like um, warmth. Temperature, he'd say, you know, the motion of molecules would be a primary quality. There is a quantifiable temperature, which we can measure, measure by centigrade or Fahrenheit. But how it feels to us, warm or cold, is the effect of the emotion on us. And something may feel warm to one person, cold to another. And of course, the same temperature may feel warm at one moment, cold at another. It's like my parents used to say, if I you know, was in winter, you know, I lived in Maine, and I'd say, well, I'm cold, you can turn up the heat. And they'd say, no. And of course, the, when they do, they say, go outside for a while, you'll feel warmer. And they were right. You go outside, and it's like 20 below zero. The house feels a lot warmer when you come back inside. Or likewise, if you're in you know, Florida and you feel like it's, it's too warm inside, you go out and stand in the sun as long as you can take it. You come back inside, it feels much, much cooler. Because it was 105 outside, it being like 80 degrees in the house, that feels cool. Now, color for him is, is also a secondary quality. And the reason for this is he claims that color is not up there in the world. And one reason why we, you know, and he uses arguments that are pretty standard now. For example, depending on the light, color looks different. Which is why, uh, to use you know, two concrete examples, one is in paint. I've done a fair amount of experience, not like you know, fine artistic painting, but slapping paint on walls of houses. And when doing that, like when picking, picking colors, it's not just a matter of you know, how the color looks just objectively, because there is no such thing. It all depends on a lot of factors, like how it looks in the lighting of your house, how it looks against like, the other colors, the furniture, etc. So something that may look fine, like in a sample, if you, for one example, I picked out a color from my bathroom, and it looked you know, good, <laughs> the sample in the store, and then I painted the bathroom, I'm like, wow, that's super, super creepy dark. <laughs> and so I had to repaint it, because it was just too, it was scary to <laughs> But it did look good originally. Another example is uh, taste. Uh, years ago, when I was in grad school, there was a cereal called Kix, K I X. I think it's still around, probably. And they had a commercial where they said the taste is in the shape, and they were right. One of my my friends said 
they're locking. It's, you know, the, the primary, the taste, the secondary qualities, and the primary quality of the shape. And they were totally right because the way it works is, you know, the taste is you have the molecules and components of the food, and it interacts with our taste buds, and then depending on how it interacts, we have the sensation of a particular flavor. And we now know pretty well that you know, Bach was right because there are some people who are known as super tasters, which actually can be a bad thing because usually the stuff they super taste tastes bad to them. So it's not like a great super, like I can taste anything. It's like, oh God, I taste all the horrible things. And there's a particular chemical that a certain percentage of people can taste, but to everyone else it has no, no flavor. And so, but if there was really a primary quality, it would all taste the same, everything would taste the same to everybody. But we all have different, different tastes. That's how the primary qualities interact with our, you know, our, you know now be our biochemistry and physi physiology. And that seems, you know, pretty reasonable. There's the qualities that are really out there, and then it's how we experience the world. Now, where the problem of the external world kind of sneaks in is this is all we ever really experience. And we never, in a way, we never really truly experience the primary qualities because we experience, you know, colors and taste and warmth and cold. We never really experience temperature. We experience things being warm or cold. And we, we see like the thermometer and say, oh, it's you know, 32 degrees. But we never actually experience that because we're not scientific instruments. And this will lead to our next dead guy, uh, Barclay, who says, there's none of this. It's all just this. Because we don't need these because we never actually experience them. Now, the third thing he considers is powers. Not like superpowers, but the power of things. Basically, it's a power a body has through primary qualities to affect the primary qualities of other things. For example, um, fire has the quality of being able to make certain metals liquid. You can, you can melt lead. Or the sun you know, can bleach the color out of, out of things. Going back to paint, painting, if you, ever, if you paint and you have sunlight going in the room, eventually it'll fade the colors. Which is why if you don't like to paint a lot, white is actually the best choice because white fades to white. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, the other colors look, look better, but that's why I always paint my ceilings white, because I just want to paint the ceilings once and save a trip. Of course, then it gets kind of dirty, and that's, you know, then you just pressure wash it or something. God, I hate painting so much. <laughs> As I used to, that's how I used to, I made my money for, a lot of my money for college was painting. And I, fortunately, I only have to paint like once every like 10 years now. You know, that's, about, that's about how long the paint is good for me. It's like, God. And mainly because um, I remember when I paid, they didn't pay that much. It was like, you know, minimum wage. Now it's really expensive. So I, I, I was pricing it like, holy crap. What do you mean a thousand dollars for a room? I'll pay that myself. I hate it. <laughs> yeah. So how does Locke reason for the distinction? Well, again, he says, if we go through all those experiences, we'll notice that, like in the case of, uh, well, shape. Objects are the same shape to everyone. Now, you know, depending on how you're looking at it, the shape looks a little different, but we would all agree that the rectangular desk is rectangular. Although I kind of wonder, what if someone had like, you know, cubist or surreal vision? They saw the world as a cubist painter, so everything is messed up. The color, of course, varies from condition to condition, like the lighting affects it, uh, condition of a person's eyes. For example, um, colors are different. Like uh, like most people, everyone's eyes are a little, little, not exactly the same. In some cases, it's different enough that if you look at something, it actually, the colors are actually different depending on the, you know, which eye you're using. Which, unless there's actually two realities that your eye is seeing, it does show that the color is, is a secondary quality. And so is, oh, it also, of course, uses the classic example of the, um, the bowls of water. You, know, you have like a, you take a bowl of water and put ice in it, have a warm bowl, be very warm, and then have a lukewarm one. If you stick your hand in the cold water and then put it in the lukewarm one, it feels pretty warm. If you stick your hand in the hot water, put it in the lukewarm one, it feels kind of cool. Even though the temperature is, you know, the lukewarm is the same, it just depends on your, your experience. 
So, yeah, pretty well learned. And so it does seem like a reasonable distinction. There's the stuff that, that the sciences tell us are out there. There's the world we experience. Then there's the powers, which then people really kind of forget about. And then he has the standard arguments for it. And that is a pretty stock, stock approach. And even today, we still, you know, we do have the qualities of science that we consider, even though they don't use the term that much anymore. And then there's the subjective experience qualities. Before pressing on, anything about primary, or secondary, or pain? Oh, and I recommend the, if you if you're, don't like paint a lot, get the paint that has both primer and paint in it, because then you just do one, one coat. And cheap paint is often not a uh, best choice, because then if you're painting over uh, something, then like one of the rooms I painted was, was red over white. And the first time I painted over, it looked like a slaughterhouse, like this blood was ever took like four coats. So there was, there was this, this, the pain, pain, plus the psychological damage of standing in a room that seemed like a bloodbath. Now, when it comes to theories of ideas, one is what's called, one classic one is what's called naive or direct realism. And that's best uh, summed up by the statement, what you see is what you get. And that can be kind of illustrated by, you know, kind of like a bad girl. Well, I, mean, I guess, uh, yeah, do something. You kind of think of it like, I wish I had a stock and export markers. I've got tons of these things. You can imagine it's kind of like uh, naive realism. In a way, it's kind of like, um, to use an analogy, it's like someone riding in a big robot. And imagine like you, know, you are the robot, but you're also the person riding it. And so the idea is, you know, the things just come in. Literally, what you see is what you get. It's the kind of analogy I think of. It's like you've got holes in your head, and you're sitting there looking at that stuff. Of course, it doesn't really work because then you have like, well, what about you know, this is like the same thing? But, yeah. So here's your, you know, here's the mind, and then the stuff just goes kind of directly in there. And actually, there, there was the view that there was like um, skins that would come off things because you know people were trying to work on vision and the theory of um, photons and so forth. And the idea was that you know skins where things were flying off and like getting into your eyes, which is, it sounds like a horror movie or something, you know, creepy and awful. But the idea was like the skin of, not literally the skin, but like the surface of something would fly towards and get stuck in your, your brain. That's how you saw it. And so direct or naive realism is literally what you see is what you get. It's blue is out there. The taste is in the pizza. And it's usually what, you know, if you ask kids, you know, if you ask like a three-year-old, where is the color? They'll, they'll point to the object. Or if you say, where is the taste? They'll point to the, to the food. Now, representational realism, or representative realism, is this. And it's pretty much the view that's standard today. If you, you know, take um, classical psychology, et cetera, this would be, they would probably use this terminology, but this is how it would work. The idea of you know, this is the mind, you have the senses, and then you experience objects. And the idea is that the objects you know, cause, you get the physiology of the, you know, the retina gets you know, stimulated off your nerve, off your know, visual uh, cortex, blah, blah, blah. And then you have a representative representation in your mind. So you have a representative of what's out there. You know, crudely put, you have a picture in your mind of what's, of what's out there. And it's representative because this is not that. You don't really have a you know, a table in your head. And it's realism because what's out here is what's in there. Whereas direct realism is you literally, there is no distinction between the object and the idea. You're just, you know, experiencing the object. In this case, you do have a distinction. You've got the object experienced, and then you've got the object represented. And that's kind of the standard today. I mean, again, you talk uh, to psychologists or people who do Neuro stuff. They'd say, yeah, you know, you get stuff hits the eye, blah blah blah. You get then you get a picture in your in your head. Now, one note, notes, this is an important uh, innovation, is that we actually our perception involves judgment that we are making judgments. So, part of representational realism is that it's 
processing. We're processing the data that comes in. And he gives the example of, um, well, if we uh, take a globe of, of one color, like a, say like a blue sphere, or like a, like it's like a steel color, ever water, colored water bottle. Now the idea we actually get is of a, you know, you know two-dimensional object in a way. We have, a, like in the case of like a, of this, we have the idea of a, well, I guess a sphere is a better example. If you have like a, a round blue sphere, what you actually have an idea of is a circle with different shape. And what we do is we judge that that shaded circle is actually a sphere. I mean, a good, a good example of this is, well, the easy example I used before. Um, once when I was at Ohio State, out for a run, there was a hailstorm, big hail, painful hail. I didn't feel like getting a, getting a concussion. And I was by the uh, stadium. And of course, they lock up stadiums, uh, you know, keep people from going in and doing bad things. And they had these, these alcoves, or it seemed like alcoves from the distance. I thought, okay, I can run up and they kind of like press in the alcove and avoid being pelted by the, the hail. And then when I got close to them, I realized that I had judged them to be alcoves, but they were not. What appeared to be alcoves were there as painted and shaded. They did a pretty good job because it, it fooled me. <laughs> but they were just you know shaded and painted, so it looked like there was kind of like on the um, the Coliseum, but it was just a flat wall, painted to look like like that. that. I was like, oh, you bastards! <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> no escape. And so I said to top of that, and, you know, get some brain damage. I hope, hope I recover eventually. Yeah, and so I judged them to be, you know, an indentation, but I was was wrong. And similarly for other stuff, we 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 judge and interpret. Now this is actually what makes you know video games virtual reality possible. Because even though they talk about like the virtual reality screen, you know, the screens, etc. we look at, the screen is of course two dimensional. You know, it doesn't, um, if you take like the, what is it, the, the Google version, I think they have one that's like a, or is, is it Samsung? Yeah, the goggles. Yeah, this one is just, hey, you put on some goggles and you stick a smartphone into the goggles. And it, of course, it's still just a flat. It doesn't like wrap around your, your head. And so you're, you're getting the impression of, you know. Actual games. Yeah. Yeah, same. yeah but it's still just two-dimensional. Two and the way it works is basically by the you know the shading, you know. So looking at say uh, like that pillar thing there, it, you know unless I go up and touch it, it could just be painted that way. You know, it could fool me like that, like that alcove. I'm still mad about that, like that alcove uh, did. And so a lot of people seem to be right. That was an important you know innovation that our perceptions are actually judgments. And in a way, I guess for you know people working on video games and so forth um, in 3D movies, it's good that that's the way it works. So that enables us to have you know video games. We we're watching a two-dimensional screen, but we're judging that it's you know that there's depth. We're getting the illusion of, of depth. Now going back to the problem of blindness, there was a, a thinker named um, Bono. Oh no. And he came up with the following problem, which is a pretty you know, clever problem. He wondered, suppose you had someone who was born blind, who had never seen anything, and they knew how to distinguish you know, shapes by touch. They could tell like a sphere from a pyramid from a square. If the person suddenly gained their sight, would they be able to tell by sight which shape was was which? Which one? I mean, they'd, they'd be able to tell like they're not the same shapes, but would they be able to go from their you know touching experience to the visual experience and know that okay, that's the cube, that's the pyramid, that's the you know that's the sphere? And Mono said no, you wouldn't be able to tell. And Locke also said no, you wouldn't be able to to tell. Now his reasoning was you know based on his theory that the, there's no ideas in the mind, they don't come from the outside, and so if you had an idea of touching, that would not be an idea of seeing. That you, you would need the experience of, of touch to correspond to the, 
experience of seeing to connect the two. You wouldn't be able to know that a priori. Now, for quite some time, it was purely theoretical, the problem. It was just, you know, Locke said that's how far it's going to work out. But they actually were able to finally test it. They got someone to, uh, I guess, to volunteer, saying, okay, you know, because they thought it was blind, they found a way to give the person sight. And they said, okay, let's, you know, <laughs> let's run this test. And actually, they were doing, um, recently, it was National Geographic, I was reading about, there, there was um, a clinic that was, I think it's someone got like funding to help people get their sight, but they are doing it through research, researching how sight works. So they, it's kind of a clever way, we're gonna help these people, but we're, we're gonna get like research money to, to do that. And they were interested in like, how much of all what we see is learned and how much is built, you know, kind of built in. And one thing that was, that was kind of interesting was that it does seem to confirm a lot of what the empiricists claimed. Uh, one example is the picture of a cow. They show someone a picture of a cow, and they ask the person to draw like what is one object, what is what is the object, and it was you know one of the cows that's you know got the different you know colors, and they found that even though someone knew about like cow, they hadn't seen it, and so they would often you know break it up by the the colors, you know, which would make you know okay the white part is cow, this is another another object. And so interestingly, it turned out the theory was you know, correct. And so much of what we what we think is kind of like built in does seem to be learned. Now the reason why we, we don't notice it is because we're learning how to do this from like before we can talk, from like day zero. So to us it seems like okay, you know, we're easily recognized, you know, shape and, and sight because we've always done that. But if you take someone who was born blind and then get sight, then they have to learn how to make all those those connections. And they have to figure out, for example, well, one problem they have is distance. Because uh, when their eyes are closed, they understand distance because they've experienced when their eyes are open, then in a way it's almost some people actually, interestingly, they they regretted getting their, their sight because it made it so much more difficult. They were it's a hard time. You know, here they are like in their twenties or thirties trying to learn stuff that you know, everyone else learned as babies, like distance and, and so on, they're having a hard, hard time. Eventually, I think they all said, okay, yes, that was a good, a good thing, but at first they were like, this is really, this is really hard. More epistemology. So what is knowledge for Locke? Well, for him, it is essentially how ideas relate. So ideas that fit together would be knowledge, and ideas that don't fit together, that don't relate properly, would not be knowledge. And so he claims that knowledge is the perception of the connection and agreement, or disagreement and repugnancy of any of our ideas. So what's a true claim for him? Well, a true claim is one in which the ideas are properly related. So it's how things fit together. Now, as you might imagine, uh, the question of like what is knowledge and what is truth is something that gets debated quite a bit. So Locke kind of has a, a version of what's called the correspondence theory of truth. And it's kind of our intuitive view. You know, a claim is true means that it gets things right. So if our idea matches the world, we'd say that's true. And if our idea fits together, you know, properly with other ideas, we'd say, okay, that's true. And of course, there are others who say that they have other alternatives. For example, there's the uh, coherence theory of truth, that it's not what's here corresponds to what's not there. It's how the ideas, you know, uh, cohere together, like the web of belief. It's kind of like, to use an analogy, it's kind of like the CAS shows, you know, or like Sherlock Holmes. You take all the pieces and they all fit together, then how they fit together tells you which person is guilty. Now, like other thinkers, he believes in different types and degrees of knowledge. One is what he calls intuitive knowledge, which is this. And this is, this notion goes way back to people like, like Plato and before. 
And he says, this is where you see the connection between ideas immediately. For example, that white is not black, that a circle is not a triangle, that three are more than two, and equal to one and two. And he claims, he you know, draws on the notion of the light of knowledge or illumination. And he claims that when you have this kind of knowledge, it is, the mind is filled with a clearer light. You just see it immediately, there's no doubt, there's no hesitation, the truth just kind of shows itself. Now, of course, one of the problems with this, and we saw this also in Descartes, how do you know if something is just self-evidently true or illuminated by the light of, of reason or intuition or whatever, and you just kind of like really, really believe that it's true? So there's always been a bit of a problem here, working out how do you know when it's really, really true, and it's just the truth is showing itself to you, and how do you know when you're wrong about that? And of course the claim is, well, you just see the truth, but people seem to see the truth in things that don't turn out to be true. And Locke himself did write an essay called On Enthusiasm, which he did consider that, you know, just because someone's very, feels very strongly about something, doesn't mean that it is true. So we remain with that problem. How do we know when it's the light of intuition shining down upon something? And how do we tell that from when we just really, really feel that it's true, but we're actually wrong? So this is the most certain. This stuff, um, similar like with Descartes, if it's intuitive knowledge, it can't be wrong. And the good question is, is there anything like that? And Locke thinks, yeah, gives those, those examples. Now, where Locke and Descartes differ is here, well, among other places. Descartes believed you could have intuitive knowledge, a prior knowledge of things existing, specifically God. Locke thinks you have intuitive knowledge of your own existence. You can't be wrong about that. But he thinks nothing else. So the only thing you can prove that exists just, you know, by intuitive knowledge is yourself. And even that he thinks is being empirical because you see that you exist because you're seeing you. And you're like, okay, <laughs> all right. Now what about other stuff? Well, the next level, which is weaker, is what he calls demonstrative knowledge. This is where the connection between ideas is not immediate. But you have to go through a series of logical steps. Now again, he's still, he's still following a well-established tradition. You know, this is, you know, going back to Plato, this is the level of rational intuition, you know, the light of, light of reason. And this is a level of basically proofs, you know, mathematics, etc. Now, the reason why this is not absolutely certain is because of the following thing. In demonstrative knowledge, as long as you take, you know, it involves doing steps, like a proof. As long as each step is done correctly, and you're certain the step is done correctly, then you can be certain of your results. You know, it is essentially a deductive reasoning. Now the problem, and this is where, you know, Descartes skepticism kind of bites in, is that if you're taking steps, there's always the worry that the previous step was something went wrong with it, that there was some mistake in the, as they say, a mistake in the calculations. You, know, you didn't carry the one or the decimal point in the wrong place. So it's, you know, it's very much like doing math or engineering. If you do all your steps correctly, then yeah, you can be sure. But you can't be sure you did all your steps correctly. So there's still kind of room for, for doubt. The, the method itself is certain, if done properly. But you may not be sure that it was done Properly. I mean, a good illustration is deductive logic. If you have a valid argument and you have all true premises, your conclusion has got to be true. But you may wonder, is my argument actually valid? Maybe I got that wrong. And are my premises actually true? Maybe I got that wrong. But, you know, hypothetically, if it's deductive, valid, and all premises are true, your conclusion has got to be true. So you can be certain that if you're certain, you're certain. The third type is what he calls sensitive knowledge. 
it's not like top secret stuff. It's not like your knowledge that's got to be stamped top secret. You know? Need to know basis. This is all, well, before we left, uh, this would include geometry. It would also include, for Locke, God's existence. So he would disagree with, with Descartes that God's existence is not known intuitively. We just don't see that. What we have to do is go through a proof. So God still does get kind of a special status because we can prove God's existence, he believes, with certainty. Now, we can't do, do it a priori, but we can be sure about it, he claims. We can be sure of our own existence because it's self-evident. We can be pretty sure of God, he claims. Now, everything else, though, falls under sensitive knowledge, what we get from our senses. So this is still weaker. So this is absolutely true, no possible doubt. This is, yeah, if we're doing everything right, if we're sure we're doing it, if we're sure we're certain, if we're certain we're certain, it's certain. And this is, yeah, probably, probably okay. Now, he does think that even though we can't be certain, we can get good enough. You, know, you might have heard the expression, good enough for government work. Uh, same sort of deal. You know, can we be absolutely sure that we got things, our perceptions are right about stuff? Well, no, we can, we can be misled, we can see things, we can mishear things. Uh, you know, we can be confused about stuff. I mean, and there, without getting into weird metaphysical or epistemic doubts, this kind of really practical stuff, like thinking, you know, someone's talking, and you miss here, was that, was that um, you know, is that number four or two? You know, can't, can't tell. Or someone's talking, and you're not sure whether they're saying um, la bossier or la bossier, you know, v or b. Or you see someone that looks like a lot like your friend, but then you realize, oh, it's just someone who just looks a lot like my friend. Hope before you yell something. And so, yeah, his view is we can be wrong about this stuff, but he doesn't you know, fall into that Cartesian skepticism. So his view is basically, yeah, it can be wrong, but you know, probably wrong. So what about certainty? Well, Descartes was basically certainty or death. Not really, but kind of. And so Descartes wanted to go through the meditations and end up with something indubitable. Something that would be 100% guaranteed. He, he thought he got that. Mott, though, takes a very modest view of certainty. Uh, in the case of science, he thinks, for example, well, I take, for example, like physical sciences and chemistry. If we take um, gold, gold, of course, we find always a certain qualities. You know, there's a particular color, a mass, density, volume, malleability conductivity and so on. But log claims, we don't, we don't find any necessary connections between them. Which means, what basically that means is, a necessary connection would be such that, in this context, like, that gold would always have to have these qualities. That if it has this quality, then it must have this quality. It can't be otherwise. Now, something like the triangle, you know, we have a necessary connection. If it's a triangle, it's got three sides. Because, it can't be a four-sided triangle. But when it comes to the you know, physical world, we don't have those same, we, we don't have a thing like, if it's gold, then it has this mass or this quality by necessity. And what he thinks is what we mostly do is we, we just find you know, conjunctions. Gold, all the gold we find is this quality. But we can't find a, a true necessary connection. And this becomes you know, a point of considerable you know, concern. Uh, David Hume, look at in the next section, says there are no necessary connections. Everything is, seems loose and unconnected. But of course in the sciences, we want that kind of certainty. We want, if it's gold, then it has this mass. It always has, gold has all these qualities, the essential qualities. Now Locke does consider that maybe that if we're able to have knowledge, what he calls the minutest uh, constituent parts of any of bodies, then we might be able to know. So 
his view is currently we don't have that level of certainty. So with like a triangle, we know for sure there's a triangle three sides, always. With like gold, we're sort of saying, well, all the gold we found is like this, but is this something that's necessarily true of gold? So if you got gold, you got this. It also applies to like the laws of nature. We have, oh, we think the laws of nature. We have laws about gravity. We have laws about mass, density, and volume. And one question is, is do they hold everywhere at all times? Is, are those the rules of the universe? You know, that, you know, metaphorically speaking, that there is a rule book and it's in there and everything always does that. Or is it just, this is what we've experienced over and over again and maybe we'll find something very different in like other places or in the future. And so a lot actually hinges on that, whether we can actually trust our, our laws to be laws. And one view is they're just observations. We found, for example, that pure water always boils at 100 degrees centigrade so far. Maybe that's not true always or ever. Maybe the next time we, we boil it, it boils in a slightly different thing. Or maybe properties could change. Maybe you know today water works this way, later water works differently. And part of it is theoretical, you know, philosophical, but part of it is very practical. Can we trust all our, you know, all those scientific findings and you know, engineering and so forth? What part is that? If you've got an engineer, you've got to expect things to keep working the same, same way. Like steel works this way. It doesn't do like other stuff. So how did Locke beat the skeptic? Well, the skeptic, of course, and he's thinking about Descartes here, distrusts the senses and you know, considers that all the things we experience might be a dream. And the existence of all things is questioned, as well as our knowledge. So basically he's considering you know, the classic skeptic who doubts everything. Now Locke first gives sort of a humorous reply, but not too funny because it's pretty clear Locke should not have quit, quit his day job and gone on, you know, the stand in a comedy club. He says, well, no one can be so skeptical as to be uh, uncertain about what he sees and feels. And Locke says kind of humorously, um, the skeptic can have no, no fight with Locke because he can't even be sure Locke exists and is even saying the things that he does. So maybe there is no Locke. Which, of course, is not a reputation, but it's kind of a, oh, maybe fun. Again, which is why philosophers probably should stand common for the most part. You can think about majoring in philosophy and become a common. Stephen Colbert, for example, apparently originally intended to major in philosophy, but chose theater and ended up being super famous. Um, some people, though, did, did do some philosophy and became comedians. Like Steve Martin, for example. So what is his more serious reply? Well, he runs through some pretty stark arguments. And interestingly, the ones Descartes considered, but didn't find convincing. The first argument is this. He claims, which may be seen as begging the question, that our perceptions are produced by things exterior to our senses. How do we know this? Well, the first claim is this. If someone doesn't have the appropriate senses, they don't have the ideas. So if someone doesn't have working eyes, they don't have ideas of color. If someone doesn't work in ears, they don't have ideas of well, assuming they, they never worked. If someone doesn't have a sense of taste, they have no ideas of taste. And so he infers that since that's the case, these ideas must come through the senses. So there's got to be stuff out there. Because if you don't have the senses, you don't have the ideas, so they got to come from out there. To come from out there, they got to be out there, so they're out there. Also, second part of the argument, the organs themselves don't produce them. Why not? Well, he says, well, if they just produce them without something outside causing them, we can see colors in the dark, smell roses in winter, know the taste of pineapple before tasting it, and so on. Now, the skeptic, in a way, is a pretty easy shot at this, because someone like Descartes would say, well, how do you know you have eyes? Yeah, because his claim is, if you don't have eyes, you don't have ideas of, of things you're seeing. But a fair point would be, well, how do you know you have those things? Because that already assumes that 
it already in a way assumes there are external objects, it assumes there are eyes, you need to see the stuff that is out there. And of course, part of the question is, could you have ideas of color without actually having experienced real color or taste of things without? I mean, you can imagine a dream. Could you have a dream in which you taste something that you've never tasted before? Or seen something you've never seen before. You know, and that's you know, Descartes does consider that you know maybe maybe you can't, but then he ends up saying, well, I guess you you could. And Locke would say, well, no, you can't. You know, going back to the painter analogy, Locke would say, yeah, it's a good analogy. You can't have you, know, you may be dreaming now, but you can't have anything in there that didn't come from out there. And Descartes says, no, it could all be all be in there. And it's kind of a, um, I guess, an intuition battle. You know, could this all just be in your mind, or does it have to come from somewhere else? Second confirmation is, you know, what Descartes considers or rejects, which is this. One thing we find is that, well, basically, he rolls in a couple, a couple arguments um, in here. First one is this. One is, is that our sense experiences seem unavoidable. Namely, like we don't choose what we see. I mean, we can, of course, you know, close our eyes or look away. But if you look outside, you don't get to pick what's up there. You know, strip, you know, I mean, you could, you could, you could put stuff out there, but I mean, like, if you're just having a gaze outside, whoever's walking by, that's who you see. Uh, when, you, when you're looking at the room, you, you just, it, it's the room. So the idea is basically, <clears throat> the we're not like creating these ideas. They're appearing to us unavoidably. They're forcing themselves on us. Now, and he claims that if ideas were just in our mind, we'd be able to bring them up and dispose of them at will. So, I'm going to use an analogy. It's it's kind of like um, I mean, think of like you know the virtual reality where the person is in the virtual reality and they're like you know using like the gestures to like create stuff, you know, like, you know, putting out scenarios. Now, if it really was just ideas, you should be able to just pull things up and create them. Like, I want, you know, I want the room a different, different room, you know, Taj Mahal, you know, or, or beach, the whole class on the beach today, beach. <laughs> and, but of course, can we do that? Now, no matter how, Reality, you know, you, you, just, you just experience what you go in the room and you get what's there. I mean, you, you can physically, of course, modify it, but you can't just think and you know alter the reality. Now, so Locke takes that to be, you know, pretty conclusive proof that what we're experiencing is, you know, real. That it's not just in our mind. Because if it was just ideas, we should be able to just change and you know, because that's all we can do. If we if we sit there, we can picture a beach. We could add a house to the beach. We could change the water from, say, like a deep blue to a light green. We could add in, you know, people. We could remove people. We could add, you know, a house. We could add like a boardwalk. And so we can mentally construct all this stuff. But when we get to what we call reality, we can't. We can't do that. We're stuck. Now, one way to apply Locke is with Descartes. When you're dreaming. We know, well, we believe it's all in our, our mind. But do we have that kind of, do we have full control of our dreams? No, we're, we're kind of stuck in their experience and stuff shows up in our dream. And sometimes we can you know, consciously take control of it, but most, most of the time we're just kind of experiencing it. So the unavoidable part, you could argue, doesn't prove that it's real, it just proves that it's unavoidable. And similarly, we can use like a modern example of virtual reality. You know, suppose you, you've been kidnapped and your brain extracted and you're put into a virtual reality. Well, the fact that you don't have control over it doesn't mean that it's real. It just means you don't have control. Somebody could, you know, they could have the bad scientist piping in the, you know, the fake reality. His third argument actually jams in a, I guess kind of was not a strong point because he, he kind of jams in a couple of here. Now, the first one is pain. 
which is, in a way, an interesting argument, which is this. His claim is, is that memory doesn't hurt as much as reality. So it's kind of a pain test. I mean, everyone's, you know, trying to say, like, you know, if you're dreaming, you can tell by pinching yourself. But what he claims is this. If things are just ideas, then thinking of painful things would hurt us. Now, and he's not talking about, like, bringing up painful memories, like, oh, the, you know, the person that broke up with me, blah, 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 the, the, the pain. Um, what he thinks of is, like, you think of, I think of sometimes you're, like, injured, or hurt, like, fell down, or got, you know, bit by some type of wild animal or something. And you think about that, you can remember the pain, but it doesn't hurt as much as the real pain. So if you think, like, I think of, like, when I uh, tore my car to tendon and my legs sewn back together, I yeah, remember the pain of that. I can still remember it, but remembering it doesn't hurt as much as the real thing. Or you can also go with, like, the warmth of something. You know, if you're, if you're freezing in the, the Arctic waste, you can't think of the, you know, warmth and be, be warm. You're still going still gonna to freeze. Yeah, so his test, in a way, is that reality hurts in a way that memories do not. And so maybe the same test works for dreams. Maybe dreams don't hurt as much as reality, the pain is not as, as real. Now, of course, a skeptic could still you know, kind of stick a claw in there, so to speak, by saying, well, how do we actually know that what is hurting us is actually you know, real? I mean, there's, there's things that hurt a bunch and then things that hurt, hurt less. But maybe it's still, maybe the pain is still, I mean, because to use a skeptical argument, you may have heard of uh, phantom pain. And phantom pain occurs when a person loses, uh, like, a limb. And what happens is that they can feel itching or, or pain. But obviously, they're not feeling it in the arm because their arm's not, not there anymore. Now, I think the physical explanation is, is that they still have the nerves, you know, running there. They're sort of still, still firing. Even though, but they feel as if the pain is like in their hand, but of course it's really not. So maybe if we get a phantom pain, we could have total phantom pain. The second argument, the third one, I guess argument 3.5 or 3.1, is the measurement argument, which is this. He says, um, actually he throws in another one. Oh, no, it's sort of an important one. Um, one thing he brings up here is this. Descartes and others agree that we can be certain, well, initially Descartes believed that we can be certain on geometric proofs or logical proofs. And we can, we can do like, you know, do um, Pythagorean theorem or do like something with circles or squares. And Locke says, well, if we use diagrams to prove things with certainty, how can, then can we doubt the existence of the diagram? So therefore, we should accept that, you know, reject that skepticism. So if we accept that you know, a proof using you know, math is, shows something decisively, conclusively, then we should accept the existence of the diagrams and so forth we, we use. Now, of course, a counter to that would be like Descartes said. You could be dreaming a proof. And a proof is still a proof. A dream proof is still a proof. But it doesn't prove that what you're doing actually exists. Uh, and actually, one example of this, oh, God, I was taking um, uh, there's a logic class that in, in Ohio State everyone had to take, and it was the, it was basically a hurdle. Every 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 grad program has the death class that's designed to weed people out. Law school the same way. There's always like a death class that its function is to be ridiculously hard to fail people people out to be evil. And I, when I took the class, I remember it was so bad. I was having nightmares about the test we had to take on the exam. And actually solved one of the, the problems in the nightmare. And of course, it was all in my dream, so I was working this stuff, you know, none of that was, was real, but I still came up with the right solution, I wrote it down, I was like, God, I hate this so much. <laughs> what am I doing with my life? But interesting argument. The fourth confirmation is this, and it actually throws in a couple more. So it's like four point and four point one. First one is the confirmation that you have supported, namely that if you see a fire, you can confirm it by the warmth. So you can sort of, well, in a way, this is good practical advice. So if you're wondering, you know, is that a hologram? 
you know, if it's warm, it's not. Or if you wonder, is that what appears to be a column, is that really a column, or is it just painted cleverly? And of course, the way to, to test it is to, to touch it. Now, of course, what the skeptic would say is, well, um, maybe both senses could be deceived. You know, that's not that your vision is being deceived, your sense of touch is being deceived. And so the fact that one confirms the other could just mean you're being deceived like a whole, whole bunch. Now, 4.1 is pain. And this is sort of weak, this is sort of similar to the previous one, but he brings it up again. Now, he takes example, in a way it's kind of a mean refutation, he takes example of fire. Um, can, if you think of fire, can you burn yourself on your idea of fire? Can you toast marshmallows? No. So his view is, well, there's a difference between real fire and idea of fire, and one can toast marshmallows, one cannot. But again, the skeptic would say, well, yeah, there's a difference between, say, you're thinking of a marshmallow or a fire, but maybe what you're experiencing is not I mean, it's different, but maybe it's not actually real. Argument 4.3 is the writing argument. Now, if you have a piece of paper, can you write on the paper with your mind? No, I mean, not yet. I mean, eventually you'll have that kind of thing. But. And also, once you write on the paper, can you change the words on the paper just with your mind? No, so what he thinks is, well, the characters he writes down, he can't put them there just by thinking about them, he's going to write them. And once they're there, he can't change them by thinking about them. So it goes back to kind of his view that he can't control reality with his mind. He can control ideas with his mind, so reality is not ideas. Now again, someone of course could you know, reply, I mean, you think like a, a video game is not real, but of course you can't